Welcome to Fox Hills Black Report, your daily source of black news, black views, and black opinions. Today is Thursday, May 12th, and I'm Mimi Brown. And I'm Romeo. I'm Demi Lobo. And on today's report, as Roe versus Wade remains a main topic of discussion, Democrats are planning their next move in an effort to make abortion rights a federal law. Attorney Ashley McFarland joins us to break down the latest. Meanwhile, the midterms are slowly approaching and Democrats are pulling together their resources to launch a multi-million dollar voter organization effort. But what challenges will they face? Then a controversial attorney general has made his official bid for governor. But how does the community feel? We have that story. Plus, social media sensation Tabitha Brown McCormick's Sunshine Spice could be in a grocery store near you. And Black China claims the judge in her defamation case was biased against her and her lawyer. We have the details. Matter of fact, we have all that and so much more. It's our voice and our truth. So let's get it. Democrats are plotting their next move after a symbolic vote to make abortion rights a federal law fails in the Senate. The bill fell short of the 60 votes it needed to advance with Senator Joe Manchin joining Republicans. All of this comes just weeks after a leaked draft opinion shows the Supreme Court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. The question now, though, is can Democrats do uh, protect abortion rights around the country? Joining us today to talk about it is Ashley Martin. She's a former federal prosecutor who has expertise in health care and legal matters. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of course. So yesterday the Senate voted to codify Roe v. Wade. Can you explain exactly what that means? So what that means is after the draft opinion was leaked, uh, showing that the Supreme Court, as you said, is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, that would mean that the in order for it to become a law, federal law, the Congress would have to pass an act to codify it or to uh, specify the law within the federal regulations and the federal laws. And in order to do that, it needed 60 votes in the Congress to pass a federal law that gives women the right to abortion without excessive, excessive state restrictions. Um, and that did not pass, as you said, Mimi. Mm -hmm. You know, conservatives have been trying to overturn Roe v. Wade since the very beginning. But, it's, you know, it's been nearly 50 years. And so Democrats have had larger majorities in the Senate. But why wait now until the court is six to three conservative to try and codify, codify Roe into a federal law? Well, as the vote yesterday shows, it's extremely difficult to get a majority to pass uh, this federal law to protect women's reproductive rights federally. Um, it's been difficult since Roe v. Wade was issued in 1973. And so uh, it will continue to be difficult. And that's why the Democrats are turning to state legislatures to make sure that we, that at least the states can continue to protect this right. Those that were have trigger laws that as soon as Roe v. Wade actually passed or sorry, is is um, dejected by the Supreme Court, these trigger laws would allow the state laws to enact automatically that would ban abortions in various Republican states. So it's important to, to, to attack this on two fronts. One, for the Democrats to continue to try to pass federal legislation protecting this right, and also to ramp up the fight within these states that have these trigger laws and, and, and oppressive uh, laws that restrict abortions on the state level. Yeah, I want to talk to you more about the state, the state level. But before I get there, I want to talk to you about, um, you know, gay right activists. They're worried that same sex marriage may now also be in jeopardy. Is that a reasonable fear? And if so, what else could possibly be in trouble? Are we talking interracial marriage, contraceptives? What else is on the chopping block? You know, it, I believe they have a right to be worried in a sense, because this would be the first time that the Supreme Court takes rights away necessarily since Plessy v. Ferguson, um, typically Brown versus Board of Education would overturn Plessy v. Ferguson, but it gave rights to people. It didn't take rights away. And so this would be the first time in which rights would be taken away from people that were granted by precedent in the Supreme Court. And it's very, very rare that the Supreme Court overturns its own precedent. So that is why it's causing so many people that have, that have rights that have been given or granted by Supreme Court decisions to be worried about the sustainability of those rights. So let's talk a little bit more about what's going on at the state level. You mentioned trigger laws. We know that 26 states have either made abortion illegal or restricting a woman's right to get the procedure done. But is there anything that can be done individually on the state level to fight that? Uh, 
folks have to vote. If they don't agree with the laws that are in place, they have to get behind uh, new politicians, new people, new candidates that are supporting what they support. And there are races all over the country, primary races, general elections, that people have to get behind candidates that support and stand for uh, women's reproductive rights. Um, and in all of these states and in states where we think that we're protected, uh, you have to get involved, you have to vote, you have to be a part of the process if you want to ensure that your rights are protected. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. Always have to vote on that local level, too. Uh, <laughs> critics of the court say the leak may have been a political maneuver by maybe a pro-choice jurist or a court aide to sway public opinion on the abortion issue. But if there's a side, if any, which side does the leak help? If there's a side, the video, let, let me say this first. It's unprecedented that this was leaked from the Supreme Court level. They have the most protective me measures to protect their internal debates. So it's actually astonishing that this was leaked. Um, but if I have to say if it advantages either side, I think it would advantage the Democrats. It's allowing them to mobilize people on the local and state and federal level to wake up that these rights that we so often take for granted are actually in jeopardy. And so it's allowing them to rally up their bases to get behind the candidates and the uh, elected officials who actually support what they believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, last question before we let you go, Ashley. The Supreme Court justices are set to meet today for the first time since the leak. You know, so what happens next? I, I think there's going to be a very aggressive investigation onto how this leak happened. They're going to... Uh, really, really, I think, uh, try to secure this process. Uh, right now, there's justices that are facing protests outside their homes. Um, I think the very forefront issue here is to how do they protect their process to get to the final decision of what this is going to be. We don't know if the final ruling is going to reflect this draft opinion or not, uh, but it would be interesting to see. And in the meantime, they've got to do better about securing this process. They've absolutely got to do better about securing this process. Ashley Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brett. Of course. As the midterm primary election season moves into high gear, Democrats in Florida are pooling together their resources to launch a $15 million voter organization effort. In what may prove to be Florida's last stand as a battleground state, now Democrats are launching a $15 million voter organization effort ahead of this year's elections. Now they've agreed to hire 200 organizers and open as many as 80 campaign offices around the state. They're hoping to shift the state back into the Democrats' column, but the blue shift Florida campaign, it will be a challenge for the party that has lost the last two presidential elections in the state. Party officials are hoping Congresswoman Val Demings to take Mark Rubio's Senate seat will push black and progressive voters to go to the polls. Student loan debt is at an all-time high. In the first quarter of this year, it hit $1.6 trillion. Overall, student loan debt, uh, we're talking about $16 trillion in total. That's over 10% of all household debt in the United States. It's the second largest category of consumer debt. Home mortgages is number one. The news comes as President Biden is said to be considering forgiving $10,000 of student loan debt. He has extended student loan payment for forbearance until August 31st. Progressives are encouraging him to get rid of all the student loan debt. That. But Mr. Biden says that the, hmm, he said in the past that it probably won't happen. And several prominent conservative groups are saying no to Dr. Oz and yes to a black female Senate candidate. Him and Oz is running for the Republican primary, the U.S. Senate of Pennsylvania. He's a favorite of President Trump. But groups like the Club for Growth are backing his opponent, conservative commentary, uh, Katie Barrett. The Club for Growth spent millions to defeat J.D. Vance in Ohio, who was also a favorite of Trump. But Vance won the primary. Conservatives are worried Oz isn't anti-abortion enough. Recent polls show a tight race. Election day in the state is Tuesday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' voting map, which eliminates a black congressional district, has been ruled unconstitutional. Federal Circuit Court Judge Lane Smith cited a voter-approved amendment to the state constitution that requires maps be drawn in a fair manner. DeSantis vetoed a voting map that was approved by the state's Republican majority legislature. Now, critics say that DeSantis' map, it would eliminate up to two districts held by Congressional con Congresswoman Val Demings and Al Lawson. Now, black voting rights activists in Florida, they say that DeSantis is trying to disenfranchise black voters in the state. 
An investigative reporter by the Reuters, Reuters News Agency says five police trainers who teach hundreds of officers around the country have ties to far-right organizations. The probe of the officers found political commentary that consisted of QAnon conspiracies, racial slurs, and homophobic language. Authors of the report say the, the reason why their political and social views are important is because their opinions can influence young officers. A number of people arrested at the January 6th attacks at the Capitol were police officers. Some of them belong to white supremacist groups like the Oath Keepers. And the Department of Justice is reopening an investigation into the murder case that sparked the 1970 Augusta riots. The probe will look into the killings of Charles Oatman. Oatman was a black mentally challenged teenager who had been jailed for months. He died May 9th, 1970. An all-white jury convicted two black teens of his death, even though two white cops were charged with excessive force after arresting Oatman. They were acquitted of the assault. It's believed the officers were the ones responsible for his death. Oatman's death sparked anger and an uprising that lasted two days. More than 100 blocks of neighborhoods and businesses were vandalized. A total of six men were killed in the riots. According to records, they were shot in the back by all white officers who were later promoted. In fact, one of the officers involved in the event was later named Officer of the Year. Oh, there's so much here. Yeah, it is. There's so much here. It's just, it's just a matter of where do you start. I mean, and the, the thing is, they're saying 50 years later mm -hmm. that they're still dealing with things like this. They're saying back during that time how a black neighborhoods just would not have sewage. They didn't have things of that nature. They were mistreated. And there are things that people can still bring up right now mm -hmm. that should haunt them, right? I mean, people feel like they got away with so many things during that time. And I'm glad we're bringing these stories alive. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad the, the Department of Justice is reopening this case. You know, Charles Oatman was a six. 16 year old mentally challenged young man. Uh, he was arrested for accidentally shooting his five year old niece. And because of his mental mm -hmm. state, uh, it was definitely an accident. And he was arrested. You know, there's all kinds of things that uh, people question still surrounding his death. The police say that he fell from his top bunk, but um, there was fluid in his lungs. And so they believe that he was drowned. And so there's an investigation now that we'll find out exactly what happened, mm -hmm. uh, happened to that. And, you know, the thing is, you know, they said that his body was, it had deep gashes in it and it was burned with cigarettes. And, and what's so very sad about that is that this man, this young boy went to his death without, you know, a proper investigation. And the officers that did this to him were yeah. promoted mm -hmm. and that they were, they were called officer of the year. And mm -hmm. it's only been 52 years. They may still be alive today. And if they exactly. are, they should be prosecuted mm -hmm. to the fullest extent of the law. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, you know, uh, we're, Romeo, like you said, still dealing with this today. And so I just want to pay homage here to uh, the late John Lewis because the Emmett Till Civil Rights Crime Act, it was sponsored by John Lewis, of course, before he died. So pretty much what it did is it established that cold case initiative is what we're talking about right here to investigate unsolved killings from the civil rights er era. So, of course, we're this is going to set up so many people to get justice now in our era of 2022. And so, again, John Lewis left us way more mm -hmm. than just quotes and, you know, Absolutely. action plans. Like, he left us really, really good things to use, uh, of course, so that people can get justice for themselves and their families Agreed. years later. Agreed. Absolutely have to commend him for that. So African-American religious leaders in Indianapolis are calling for officers involved in the death of a black man suffering from a mental health ep episode to be fired. Now, this is a performance video of 39-year-old Herman Whitfield, who was an accomplished pianist. His family says that they called for an ambulance when he began having his crisis. Now, police say that when they got to the house that Whitfield was naked and bleeding from the mouth. The police report says that Whitfield moved towards officers and that's when they tased and restrained him. So far, the department hasn't really released police body camera footage of the incident, but they do say that this case is under investigation. The attorney general at the center of the Bronner Taylor case is running for Kentucky governor. Yesterday, Cameron filed the required paperwork to make his candidacy for governor official. Cameron became a conservative favorite after his office did not recommend a grand jury indictment on any Louisville police officers involved in the death of Breonna Taylor. Grand jurors later said they believe the whole proceeding was a sham. Although demonstrators gathered outside Cameron's home to demand justice for Taylor, no officers were ever charged in their role in her death. Cameron, who is a Republican, is the state's first black attorney general. He is the third GOP member to file papers for the 2023 race. They hope to unseat current Democratic governor. Andy Bashir. Um, 
look, we know how the community feels about this man. We understand that we're still saying her name. We're trying to get justice for Breonna Taylor, and we know it wasn't handled properly. And for him to step up, some people call him a token. That's what they're saying. He's a token for the Republican Party in hopes to maybe pull some votes from our side, but I don't foresee that happening. You know, I, are we saying her name enough? I Yes, we are still saying her name. But my question is, you know, are we saying her name enough? Here we have a black man who totally disregarded this black woman's mm -hmm. life. And I honestly feel like George Floyd's death, he got... We, we talked about that for such a long time. And then when... Uh, um, Derek Chauvin had to go to trial. He got what he deserved. Here with Breonna Taylor, we really didn't have a chance to say her name the way that it should have been. And this man could have made that happen. So it's such a disregard for her life that I don't even understand why he would even want to run. Like, you know how the black community feels about you. There are going to be black people in your community that have to vote you in. How would you even feel wanting to be the governor of somewhere where you have there's so much Maybe hatred? Just lost I don't himself. think he cares. I, I just yeah. don't think he cares. I, you know, we saw the way he handled Breonna Taylor's show that he did not care about the black community. Mm -hmm. He did not care about what we thought. You know, and I think that it's important to to remember. Uh, he to what to your point, Demi uh, Romeo. He is probably the token in the Republican Party. He has strong ties to Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. He yes. was his his uh, legal counsel at one point, and so. He's, he's basing it off of that. And in my opinion, if you can't do your job as an attorney general, then you definitely don't need to be governor of an entire state. Absolutely, because there are going to be way more hard-hitting issues. If you, Like you said, Mimi, if you can't handle this, and not that Breonna Taylor's death was small, but if you can't handle this here, how could you handle all of this here? That's a problem. And it's, it's really, like you said, Romeo, it's absolutely a problem. But yeah. I think, too, they put in place who they want, mm. who, who will further their agenda. Okay. And mm -hmm. so they probably feel like they can trust this man, and that's why, oh, you know, they're, sure. they're back him. Mm -hmm. And so they're not worried about what we're going to do because he probably has, you know, the, the backing of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. and so, and that's what I say. Some say he's like a puppet because yeah. they know if he gets in, he's going to do what they need him to do to make yeah. sure everything else in all the other states and with, I mean, all of the towns within that state go red. That's what they're trying to yeah. do, right? Yeah. So. yeah, it's a shame. All right. Community activists in Oakland say a new proposal that would close schools will hurt students from low income households. The plan would close or merge 11 schools due to the declining enrollment. The ACLU is suing the district on behalf of black students to stop the school closures. The area is being hurt by shrinking population of white residents who are moving to neighboring districts. The ACLU says the Oakland School District has a history of discriminating against black students and families. A Canadian education minister is apologizing for taking part in a slave auction. Yes, you heard that correctly. Stephen Lessie took part in the auction 16 years ago when he was an undergrad at Western University. Now, Lessie, who is now the Ontario education minister, he says that he was in a fraternity when he took part in the auction. The local teachers union is condemning his behavior and they're asking that he be removed from his position. They say he cannot be sensitive to the needs of black children in the district. An upscale San Francisco neighborhood with a racist past is trying to use a historic area designation to stop multifamily housing from being built in the area. That's what critics of the St. Francis Wood Neighborhood Committee are saying. The neighborhood group has been approved to be put on a national register list that allows them to avoid further development in the area. This will allow the Neighborhood Association to stop two housing projects zoned for the single family home area. Other high priced neighborhoods in San Francisco use the same method so multifamily housing won't be built in their areas as well.